So now we're going to start off with actually thinking about, okay, so now we have the data, we've captured the data, we've recorded the data. Um, how do we start processing our data? Um, so let's start with our introduction to flagging. So the first thing you're ever going to do is you're going to flag your data. When you get radio data, there is going to be spurious signals, contamination on your data, and there's nothing you're going to do, to, uh, you, you can do about it. There's always going to be bad data. So the first thing you're going to do when you get data from a radio telescope is you're going to spend some time looking at your data, flagging your data, and cleaning your data. And this is very important because unless you have good, you have good clean data, you can't calibrate your data correctly, and that's going to negatively impact the science product that you put out. So let's just start a little bit and look at our data. So this is an L-band passband of Meerkat, and you can see there is some data in there that is bad. It, um, or we define it as bad. It looks like noisy data. Okay. So the type of bad data we would be looking for is typically like this. This is what we call RFI. So it's um, given to our, it's added to our signal by terrestrial sources. So the first one here, that's um, cell phone towers um, data um, that we don't want. And these are satellite bands, and then these are some more satellite bands. So what happens is these very, very strong, powerful signals overpower the very weak extraterrestrial signals that we are interested in, and um, that actually negative impact our, uh, our ability to actually extract those very weak signals. So flagging is, uh, um, what we do is flagging is cleaning the data, getting rid of all these bad data and reducing the negative impact they have on the data. Then other type of things that we will be doing is except for cleaning the data, so it, it's a little gappy, but all the bad data is, uh, is gone now. What we also will be doing is looking for data that's caused by, um, well, bad electronics. If I have an antenna that's misbehaving, remember, I have an array of 64 antennas. Any one antenna can have a technical error at any one stage. So I'll be looking for bad antennas, I'll be looking for bad electronics, I'll be trying to get rid of those, and they're actually exceptionally easy to see, and they're also the biggest contributor to all our issues. Okay, It's generally instrumental um, issues. And then the other thing is as we move up in frequency, as Ben has moved, uh, as, as mentioned, if we move to the X band, the 8 to 9, 10 gigahertz, uh, gigahertz frequencies, then we start worrying a little bit more about the atmosphere, especially clouds and water, which at L band doesn't affect us that much. But those are the kind of things we need to find and then take out of our data. So um, <clears throat> let's just structure our talk quickly. Um, there is no single RFI algorithm, uh, flagging algorithm. There's no single way to say, okay, I, this is how I am going to flag data in radio astronomy. It depends on your data, it depends on your observation, it depends on the science. Your science say, uh, basically indicate to you how much flagging you will need. If you have a complex field, if you want to go very deep, you will put a lot more effort in it if you're just doing a survey to look for something. Um, so basically, your, your flagging uh, is very difficult to explain. So what we're going to try and do now is actually take you through a basic schedule, a basic strategy that we would advise you to always use when flagging your data or to basically an approach you can follow when you start uh, looking at your data to flag your data that will in ensure that when you first calibrate and image your data, at least you will have some reasonable result. Um, and this strategy basically um, contains, first of all, taking out all the known RFIs. So what I've just shown you is those channels that are affected that we know of by terrestrial or human sources like satellites, because they tend to stick to very narrow frequency ranges um, because they buy them from ICASA. Um, so those we can just take out by default. We know they're going to clobber our signal. We can't find a signal in there and we're going to get rid of those. And we're going to do that across the entire observation. We're going to be very aggressive about that. Then we're going to go back and look over frequency. If we can see anything about bad electronics, is there extra scatter? Is there an outlier? Is there a channel there that I don't uh, like very much because it seems to be more noisy than the others, which may be indicative of um, electronic or instrumental effects? And then obviously I am going to repeat all of this um, in successive cycles. The other thing is then in time, um, what happens is as these satellites pass over, so especially GPS, you know, they have an uplink and a downlink. 
So they have to communicate to a large area on the ground. They are very close by and they are very powerful signals. So when they go into the field of view of my telescope, they tend to actually negatively affect the very, very sensitive electronics. Remember, the electronics was built to detect weak signals. So these strong signals that come from the satellites um, negatively impact. They actually saturate. We call saturate. They just raise the electronic um, gain to a level where it becomes unusable. This is the nonlinear. Okay? And we find the time regions where this happened and we just discard those because we really can't do much about those timelines. Sorry, those time periods. Um, and then if at the higher frequency, if there's a cloud or the ionosphere cause some polarization issues, we just find those and then we discard that data as well. Incidental data like slewing and those things. So that will be um, the type of data that we try to uh, um, identify bad data through a cyclic type of investigation. And what I mean with a cyclic type investigation is that something we'll learn about in the next one is basically we will flag, um, we will be very specific about the sources we use to flag because we're going to exploit certain characteristics about them. Um, mainly we're going to stick to strong compact sources, especially in the beginning, because remember, we are going to look at our raw data. Then after that, we're going to do calibration. After calibration, we're going to go back to flagging, okay? We're going to try and systematically raise the issues out of the data um, in a, well, basically a cyclic event in a rinse and repeat cycle, one or twice um, until I have reasonably cleaned data, okay? And then there is this thing about um, flagging the source after, after calibration, just before imaging. Um, this is when we actually go into flagging the source itself. I'll mention a little bit about that, but I do want to caution you to be very, very careful when we do that. Um, because what you will find is while we're going through the, the, the mechanics of flagging, I'm going to continuously say I want a strong point source. Now, obviously, the nature of my science sources, I don't know its structure, I don't know its flux. So I can't make the assumptions I'm, I'm making when I'm using the calibrators. So when you go back, uh, when we talk a little bit about that, please be very careful about flagging a science source um, because of the fact that it is fairly unknown and we are relying on the calibration results to basically learn the structure from it. So uh, known RFI, this is where we start. This is the RFI. Um, so. On the L band, you've already seen that we have the GSMs, we have the satellites. Now the broadcasters, they like L band, so that's a one to two gigahertz um, frequency range. And the reason for that is the long wavelengths. Um, the, the long wavelengths um, actually uh, uh, is um, convenient because the waves will pass through obstacles very easily. So through walls and those things, which is why you can pick up a cell phone signal inside. It's not really perturbed by, by obstacles. Also, same reason we, we like working in our bands because it doesn't really bother about the atmosphere. I can do most of my sciences most days and um, everything just works. So the same reason why I like, we like our band, the broadcasters like our band as well. Um, but then we also have, Meerkat is a, is a wide band imaging system, we have multiple feeds. So we have L band and then we have UHF band, which is basically from 5, 550 to, to about 1.1 gigahertz, uh, 550 megahertz to 1.1 gigahertz. And this is the, the graph on the left here. And uh, you can see that one is actually pristine. And this is since analog um, has gone out of fashion. It's just quiet at that band right down to and give us this new leash on life in, in doing science in the UHF. So you see it does actually impact. So I need to know which band I work and then I, I need to address the RFI that I, that we as humans contribute to our, um, to our data in order to, to remove that and then to, uh, um, to actually look at my science. So we will be talking, um, you will have the opportunity to actually see exactly what is adding all the, uh, um, the RFI to the L band when we get to the tutorials later uh, in the uh, L band RFI frequency flagging notebook um, that uh, um, we will go through in our collab tutorial in the afternoon. So um, after I've done the obvious, so now I have the uh, um, uh, all my RFI flag. Now I have to start thinking of things that's a little bit more subtle, like my electronics, like my antennas. 
Uh, so to do that, um, I need to, to go and look at the calibrators and I'm going to look at my data in detail for a little while before I'm going to start acting. And it's very important to pay attention when you're flagging data. Flagging data is going to be probably one of the most tedious exercises that you have. But if you don't flag your data properly, um, all the bad data in your calibrator uh, and you don't remove all the bad data in your calibrator sources, you won't be able to calibrate your data. Um, it is just a thing that your antenna-based calibration will probably not succeed if we don't flag properly all our calibrators before calculating the calibration solutions on our calibrators. Um, the reason we are going to start off with our calibrators is the first time we're going to look at our data. We have uncalibrated data. Um, we have nothing to go on except the behavior that we can assume from the targets. Now our calibrators in general, we are going to say, going to assume is strong, uh, unresolved, so that means point-like sources. Um, the reason why this is actually particularly nice is because we know a couple of things. One, their flux will be related uh, to the amplitude and that will be independent of baseline and um, and, and time, which means that when I look at the amplitude of my, my calibrators, it should be stable. Well, it should have, the, I don't expect any large fluctuations across time or across my spectrum. So that's useful. I can use that to identify outliers. Um, so both in frequency and in time, okay. Um, and as I calibrate this, as I go through the calibration cycles, I expect the phases of point sources to go to zero. In the beginning, they're not going to be zero, and that's fine. I expect them to be um, to be just flat or basically um, uh, uniform. But when they, I start calibrating them, I expect them to go down to zero because they are point sources. In terms of the amplitude, now, as we said yesterday, Meerkat has a homogeneous array, which means all our antennas are the same. And what we've noticed from observation from using Meerkat is that all the antennas seem to have the same sensitivity, which means that I can reasonably expect the amplitude that comes out of all of the antennas individually to be in the same range. So they must, must be co-located, they must be located. So if I have any antenna that shows a large amplitude offset, I need to pay attention to that antenna. Something may be wrong and I may need to flag out that antenna. So let's start looking at the data. So I said, first off, we're going to look at our data. There is a number in this. We are going to use CASA in this case. And CASA does have a very useful uh, interactive flagging tool that you can use through PlotMS. Uh, I'm going to discourage the use of that starting off. As you gain more, more experience, it's fine. But starting off, the first few rounds that you spend looking at your data is to get familiar with your data and the behavior of your data. And you just do that by plotting your data. Um, and you can plot smooth versions, average versions of your data over time and frequency. This, just get a general idea of behavior of data in, 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 in your observation. Um, and when you become more comfortable and you identify bad data through this visualization step, you then act actually, when you flag it out, you flag it out explicitly. And the reason for that is if you identify something as bad data, only later to realize, well, maybe it wasn't. Let's see what happens if I add it back. You can always undo the flag because you flagged it explicitly. Um, so just to give some examples, if we want to check the phase stability um, over frequency and time, okay, um, the calibrator should that is not reasonably stable um, over time or across channels. So that means when I look at the data, I expect a flat phase, but I see the scatter, this random scatter in one or both of the polarization. It means something went wrong. Um, and I will look at per baseline phases here. So I look on a baseline level, and if I see that behavior in one baseline, I will look at both antennas in that baseline. Remember, a baseline is made out of two antennas. I look at the other baselines for both of those antennas. And if I see the behavior for any one of those antennas continue across the other baselines, I've identified my antenna and I will take out that antenna. And I will be aggressive. I will flag out that antenna in the entire data set 
because if it misbehaves in my calibrator, okay, it's always going to misbehave in my data source as well. And I'm not interested in that, that data at all. So I'm going to flag out the, uh, um, the, bad, the bad antenna across every, um, all, all my observations. Um, and then phase stability over time. Um, if, I, if I look over time and I see one of the, uh, um, the channels that suddenly has a large scatter, again, it may be indicative of an antenna error and, or a channel being effective, uh, effective. And I will go back and I'll actually look at more um, baselines and see, does, does that channel continue to have effects or only in a certain time? Over what time is that channel affected? And can I then only flag out that time series? And if I find that that time actually goes um, longer, or slightly longer than my um, calibrator, so the way I would observe my calibrator's target, secondary calibrator target, secondary calibrator, if it continues across calibrators, I will actually just um, flag out that entire chunk of time. Because again, I know if it's affecting my uh, calibrator, it's going to affect my, my target as well. And I definitely want to get rid of that in my calibrator before I start applying my calibration solutions, which we will see in the next lecture. Then once I have looked at this repeatedly, and I've, I've done um, various cross-checks between baselines and cross antennas, and I'm pretty sure I want to flag out an antenna or a time series, I use the um, explicit flag data instruction to flag out that data. Oops, sorry. And I'm going to advise that uh, perhaps we want to flag out, we want to concentrate on flagging out entire scans, entire fields, um, on antenna and on baseline. Um, I want to discourage flagging out on a baseline basis. At some stage, yes, you have no choice, you have to do it. But starting off initially, let's try to stick to just um, the fundamentals of scans, fields, antenna and times when we flag our data just in the beginning. Okay. So this is going to be our calibration um, uh, over, over time and over channel. Then um, as satellites and bad weather, as we say, will pass um, over, uh, um, uh, over our, our field of view, over our antenna, as we said, um, and we've now got rid of all our what we anticipate to be instrumental errors in our RFI. What will be remaining in bad data will be time dependent, so that will be our satellites and those things. And we want to go find these bad periods, we want to better define those. And for this, what we do is we plot our phase over time and our amplitude over time. Again, um, four point sources, they should be fairly stable um, over the time ranges. Um, so we would want not to see fluctuations, large scatter, those kind of things. Uh, what you will see me doing in both of them is actually averaging. So if I go over channel, I will average all the observations for that spe uh, specific target. And that gives me good um, signal to noise. So it gives me a smooth um, display of my passband. Similar, if I go over time, what I will now do, uh, now do is I'll take all my clean channels, okay? and I'll average all over frequency. So I only get one value per time, which will show me behavior, smoother behavior over time, which will highlight or, es or show clear more clearly show any of the outliers that I may be interested in in following up those time periods um, in closer inspection. Uh, and if the thing is, if I leave them in, what they're going to do is introduce phase errors, and that's actually going to be bad for my calibration. That's going to make my images more noisy. So I really do actually want to spend a little bit of time just to make sure that I have a clean observation over time. Um, and here you can actually combine targets. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to start off with maybe just your flux calibrator. And the reason you're going to start off with your flux calibrator is um, mainly because, well, you know your a primary calibrator, a flux calibrator is a primary calibrator. Primary calibrators are very nice because they are well-defined calibrators. Uh, most of them have models. Um, you know that they should be point sources uh, and you can trust the characteristic assumptions that we're making about unresolved sources and their stability over time and frequency. We'll use those first. 
we'll use those to clean the data. Then we will start including our secondary calibrators. Our secondary calibrators, um, they may actually uh, be slightly resolved uh, and we may want to actually just image them first, get some data, which means we need some form of calibration. So this is where our calibration step comes in and then we look at the data again. So we have to be able, during flagging, to build some distinguishing feature between um, well, actual bad data and data that may just not be calibrated as well. So we're going to do this slowly and step by step using our calibrators. So first, primary calibrators, uh, we can make great assumptions on the raw data. Slightly calibrated data, we can bring in our face calibrators, which should be point-like targets. And during calibration, we can get models for those. So now I can go further and I know that I'm actually only identifying and flagging bad data. And then uh, um, the feature I said we would mention but not discuss in great detail is when we actually uh, um, want to, to image, well, we flag before imaging. So <sighs> I spent some time flagging my data and we're going to reiterate the strategy now and that's just the flagging before imaging. I've calibrated my data. I have what I consider to be reasonably fair initially calibrated data of my target. I have some structure information, I have some um, flux information about my target, but there may still be some bad data in there, so noisy data, noisy channels, those kind of things that I may want to actually identify and flag out. So the reason why um, it's actually very, very important for me to be careful here is that that noisy channel, um, just last night spoke about the fact that there may be spectral lines. Remember, we don't only do imaging, we don't only have flat continuum um, uh, observations. We also have spectral line observations where we have this very sharp peaked features of a channel, both in emission and in absorption. And we want to be able to identify um, those and not flag them out. That isn't um, bad data, that's actually our science targets. So that's why we should be very careful about flagging on our image. Maybe first create an image, walk through the image, make sure you understand what the data is, um, rather than just go ahead and flagging as if it was a calibrator, because we can't make the assumptions. It's not a point source, it may be an extended source, there's going to be structure in there and nothing is going to work. Okay. So that is just the, um, the concept of imaging, uh, flagging before imaging. Now, since we've now quickly rushed through all the steps, let's go back and establish a strategy. Um, and I'm going to establish most of the strategy based on uh, timestamp averaging uh, over channel. So I've just touched on it quickly in terms of how I use my calibrators. So I get my data. I will um, first take out all the known, known bad channels, all the RFI. Then I will investigate by averaging over time and averaging over frequency. And I will flag out obvious outliers. And I will use only my primary calibrators. So flux calibrators and band pass calibrators because I know they should be point sources. I expect the following. I expect all my amplitudes to be located in, um, in a fairly tight range. I expect all my phases to be stable both over time and over um, frequency. They are independent of time and frequency. Okay? I will use those to find instrumental effects. That will be antennas, scans and bad time periods. I will flag those out and I will do that only on my flux calibrator. I will then use my flux calibrator to obtain a calibration solution, which I will then apply to my, all my calibrators. That's my flux calibrator and my secondary calibrator. Then I will go back to these, this pre calibrated this um, base calibrated data. So now I'm looking at my data again, again at my flux calibrator, which is now slightly calibrated. What I will see now is, um, so lower, so some more hidden 
bad data or features. So that may be noisy uh, affected uh, um, channels. There may be some slight increase in noise from one of my other instruments or the correlator might have added a bad channel for me. So I'll start picking up those things allowing me to go one level deeper in terms of flagging but still to be safe okay so when i identify these bad channels it is important now to realize when i say i want to flag these as well i'm not going to flag them in the calibrated data i'm going to use the calibrated data to identify them and i'm going to apply them as a flag explicitly flagging them in my raw data okay and now we're also going to look at, I'm going to include data from my secondary calibrator. Um, so now I can go to my secondary cal uh, calibrator. It is now calibrated, so I have a model. If it's slightly resolved, it will be better behaved. So now my assumptions will hold. Now my assumption, if the phase should be stable over time and over frequency, will be successful, it will hold. Um, I can be more reasonably assured that when I find bad data in my secondary, it is actually due to bad um, to bad data and not simply because my data was uncalibrated and I will add uh, use that to add more flags to flag out more bad periods or potentially identify um, a, a range where uh, another antenna because remember these observations are long observations anytime during an observation an antenna can have a problem okay so I can identify oh this antenna started giving problems I shouldn't use it for the rest of the observation I can take it out so that's what I'm going to uh, do there. And then I'm going to take those, um, the flag data, this additional flagged data that I've now added to my raw data. And I'm going to do redo the calibration again on flux and uh, on primary and secondary calibrators, and then relook at the data. So I'm going to do this about two, one to twice, okay? And that should get me reasonably clean data that I can then use to calibrate my data, um, my actual source flag. Um, and then if I'm well familiar with my data and I'm well familiar with my source, I know the structure, I know the expected spectral lines of my source. If it's not completely unknown to me, I can then go back and um, very, very carefully try to identify bad data in my source. Although um, we need to be, again, very careful here and I'm going to discourage that in the beginning. Until you, you've built up some, some understanding of what you're looking at and the source that you are looking at. Okay, so that's going to be the best strategy for flagging, okay, that anyone can actually follow. Um, again, the number of times you have to repeat this, how long it takes you to go through that, I can't say. So, we really can't give you uh, a recipe for flagging. Um, you have to start off by looking at your data. Depending on when you look at the data, where your data was, the number of satellites you had in your data, um, where you were pointing, anything may change. Um, uh, it, it changed the amount of flagging you do, and that's going to be data set per data set. So every one of your observations is going to be different. You can spend this time for every one of your data sets. Um, the one thing you will know is there's always going to be bad data in your data it's, and it's going to negatively affect your calibration and you will spend significant time just going through your data verifying that you have um, flagged enough data and you even may return after you've done all the calibration image your data you may be un unhappy with your data and come back and redo the flagging again this is something that's going to continuously go throughout but it's a very very important step to actually achieving good data and good um, results in your, your science output. Uh, so I think if there's one thing that's standard on radio is that there's going to be bad data. Um, rule of thumb is start by inspecting and flagging primaries, flux and band pass, as we say. Um, take care with your gain calibration, perhaps first apply uh, calibration or, or first apply flags and define on your primaries to your secondary before looking at your secondary so some calibration before looking at your secondary because especially for meerkat most of our targets will become resolved on the lingua baselines or slightly resolved so you may want to be careful on your secondary primaries we know a lot about there's a lot of information about primary calibrators but they're few and far between so it's a good place to start but you can't do all your flagging there um, Secondaries, we need to choose them to be uh, close to our target, something we will discuss during our calibration run. 
Um, so we can't necessarily make the assumption that they will, we know they will be point-alike, or that we assume that there will be some model, okay, but we can't off the bat just make a point-like assumption on the larger telescopes, maybe on the smaller ones, but not on the larger ones. And there is always an advantage by doing the rinse and repeat, the calibrate flagging, calibrate flagging cycle, at least in the beginning while you're looking at your data, to be sure that you are actually flagging bad data and not just uncalibrated data. And then err on the side of caution, always err on the side of caution, um, look at your data. Spend a little time not doing anything, just simply looking at your data. The plots we use to identify bad data, so the averaging over time, averaging over frequency, to get a, small, uh, a smoother display of the data, so the observation over time, observation over your pass band. Take a little time to use those plots just to look at your data, to look at individual sequences, individual targets, individual fields. Okay. Get to know the data before you start um, flagging. There may be a trend in your data, so data may be trending upwards or downwards. So instead of just random um, going in brute force and starting to flag out upward moving trends, you might actually be flagging something that can be corrected simply because of the trend in the data. So err on the side of caution. Take some time just to look at your data, get comfortable with your data, and then slowly go into flagging. As you start to get to know your fields, okay, so if you have a longer observation or you start looking at a field that you're familiar with, obviously this will become tedious. You will know what to do, you will know what to look for. So you don't always need to do this. But for people getting into radio astronomy or starting off in a new field with an unknown target, this may be a good, more conservative approach to ensure that you have good data going into your calibration and we are now safely flagging data, not taking out signs we may be interested in later. And now flagging, because I keep saying there is no um, algorithm for flagging, the best way for us to approach flagging is practically. So this, this afternoon we're going to spend a lot, and I mean a lot of time, basically going through various, I think there's two or three notebooks that you will be going through. It will give you some um, help or some exercises, not only to look at data, also to access data, so there's some data that you're going to download. Um, I'm going to show you where to find that um, on, on, the, uh, um, on the drive. So on the shared drive in the folders there's going to be some uh, public data you're going to download and then uh, um, you're going to work through some notebooks. You're going to get to know especially the Meerkat L-band passband and the reason for that is because that is the one most affected by RFI. We're going to see where the, what the reasons are for them. We're going to see the changes. How do we affect those changes? And then actually getting some a practical experience and flagging them. And then seeing step by step what happens when we flag out these, how we clean up our passband. Um, so there's going to be three or four. And then um, these are going to be strong primary calibrators only we're going to look at because I want you to see the behavior of this primary. So when you get to this term of outlier, you have some idea of what I mean with outlier. If I say noisy channel, it's going to be an obviously noisy channel. So we're going to have some practice um, both in downloading data from Google Drive and to access our data in the archive itself. So there's a tiny little data set that you um, are going to uh, to have to download. So you're going to get the get some exercise in getting the, the measurement um, link and then Access W getting so downloading the measurement set and then actually working with that measurement set once it is on your uh, well it is on your collab. Now since we are going to use the archive and collab extensively through this, um, if you are new, uh, I know we went through it yesterday, but perhaps during lunch or so there is on the uh, student um, on the e-learning Meerkat student uh, grid video grid. There are the two short videos, and they're 10 minutes each, about on Colab and using the archive just to give yourself a quick refresher before we move in during the, the tutorial to actually get running and then accessing the data and processing the data, which may then feel a little overwhelming to you. So please remember there's always these tutorials to you. Hopefully by now you'll all be able to access the GitHub because we did exercise that uh, um, extensively yesterday. So that's just for starting off, that's our first tutorial. 
Then we're going to start off with the NGC data set. So this is a data set that we actually prepped up for, um, for an introductory type um, tutorial. It is a small data set, but it is a spectral line data set. And the reason for that is we want you here to inspect and flag the data, but we want you to see what a spectral line will look like in the data so that when you get to the phase where you actually want to start flagging uh, in terms of your sources, um, your sign sources after calibration, that you have some, so some feeling about what the data would look like when you have uh, either an emission or an absorption spectral feature, so you know not to flag those out. Those are not bad data um, that, that's um, lying in your source. And then just depending on how you go this afternoon, we can take it slow. The most important is to get through the, through the first initial um, steps on the calibrators to get familiar with flagging. And so then also, once you get familiar, remember I said as you get familiar with your fields and your term and, and, and your, your science targets and your calibrators and you start to know what they do and how they behave, you are going to start to reach a phase where you're going to say, okay, I know this, I just want to get this done. Also, if you have the L band RFI, you're going to say, oh, that's pretty predictable. I always know where these targets are. Why should I do it manually all the time? Now, for that, we generally start building pipelines. And um, in radio astronomy, because there's so much data to process, we do that fairly quickly. Um, and in this case, I use Python. You can rerun your, your notebook um, cells. But there's also Python options where we build um, bigger Python scripts rather than just this manual um, Python notebooks. You run bigger um, Python scripts. And then when you get the data set, you just automatically run it through your uh, um, pipeline uh, script. In this case, we will do the L-band flagging in Meerkat because it is quite predictable. So I don't look at that anymore. I know it's going to be there. I just want to get rid of it. I want to look at the other things. What more do I have to flag? I don't want to waste my time. So we can start off getting um, there's, there's some indication of how to do uh, actual Python scripting to start building pipelines. And you'll hear a lot more by, about pipelines going into spectral line because if we go to the bigger data, all we have is pipelines. You can't do this by hand anymore, only on the small data sets. Um, and then uh, at that stage, I am going to, to ask you to, to go to the proper Meerkat cookbook, the proper cookbook um, that the Meerkat astronomers um, upkeep. To look at to, and, and the methods they use to visualize their Meerkat data using CatDAL and those things to assist them. So they would actually just do a quick visualization of the Meerkat, put it through the pipelines, uh, through their pipelines for flagging and calibration. And then once that the basics is done, they will start re-looking at it from scratch. 